This video is sponsored and approved by Century Films in support of their new YouTube original documentary, Terms and Conditions, a UK drill story, now available on GRM Daily's YouTube channel. NBA young boy, born Kentrell Deshaun Gordon, was born in 1999, truly living up to his name. Having never actually shot hoops professionally, the NBA actually stands for Never Broke Again. I guess now we know why they call Mr. T B.A. Baracus. And although his pockets have pledged never to go broke, sadly the same can't be said for his own neck. Clearly he wasn't a fan of Wu-Tang as a child, because NBA Youngboy famously broke his neck whilst he was wrestling as a toddler. The serious injury actually required him to wear a full neck and head brace while his spine healed, which left the three iconic head scars that he has to this day. Hey, sounds bad, but you should see what happened to the other kid. Anyway, despite being a young scar head, a young NBA Youngboy was moving like a young scar face after dropping out of school in the ninth grade and beginning his career as a jugger and finesser as a young boy. Unfortunately, he eventually found himself in a youth detention center for robbery, where he at least had some time to focus on lyrics for his future career as a rapper. When he was released, he ended up moving in with his estranged half-brother 3-3's family, and they would get back to finessing on the streets to pay for studio time. From there, Youngboy got to producing music and dropped his first ever mixtape, Life Before Fame, around 2015. The mixtape included several different covers, most of which looked like a GTA Baton Rouge loading screen that had been drawn by a six-year-old. And the tape featured tracks like Homicide and Range Rover, which showed a 14-year-old Youngboy truly had the skills to pay the bills early on. Hey, I mean, it's no toxic crew, but good effort. And while it turned out that Youngboy's talent at such a young age didn't go unnoticed, because that first mixtape, Life Before Fame, was actually released under the banner of TBG, which stands for Top Boy Gorilla, a crew with a storied history in the wild and dangerous streets of Louisiana's Baton Rouge. The crew was supposedly started by a deceased Louisiana native and affiliate of Boosie, Lil Ivy Smith. However, at this early stage in the game, Youngboy was nothing more than a promising young prospect to these top boys, because the real crown jewels of the squad at this time were a couple of rappers known as G-Money and Fredo Bang, who around this time were picking up steam with their song iPhone 6 alongside Boulevard Mel and YMM Captain. The track was a heartfelt anthem for all of the hustlers jugging off of the iPhone 6 or the Android bitch. But hey guys, never forget to share a thought for those 2003 hustlers that are still trapping off of a Nokia N-Gage with Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 installed. Hell, you can tell tell Youngboy was truly down with the TBG crew at this point because he even appeared in the background of the iPhone 6 video, as well as at one point handing a Gucci bag to Fredo Bang, a moment that would honestly be inconceivable later on in what would eventually become a deadly beef. Now, as successful as everybody looks in this video flashing off all their money, I can tell you they probably weren't making that money in the stock market. And as the story goes, these boys were flipping and finessing packs on the streets of Baton Rouge, and unfortunately soon some of that street beef would end up souring things on the music side, because the TBG crew supposedly had a beef going with another band Baton Rouge crew called BBG, or Bottom Boy Gorillas. Gang, crew, click, label, call them whatever you want, but BBG and TBG were certified ops. With a big rumor at one point going around that Youngboy's cousin Boozilla, who was BBG, had run off with G-Money from TBG's pack. Some people on the internet had even speculated that it was Youngboy that had told G-Money that Boozilla was responsible for this, after being pressed by him whilst Youngboy was still rapping TBG. This was suggested by G-Money lyrics that would come much later on in this beef, where G-Money has suggested that Boozilla wanted to murder young boy over this drama. Meanwhile, as that personal beef was developing, another more professional beef was emerging between young boy and the TBG crew. According to some, young boy had gotten frustrated with the TBG label due to the fact that he wasn't necessarily getting the money or shine that he thought he deserved from the crew. So him and 3-3 disbanded and started their own crew. NBA never broke again. From day one, that's where NBA started from like, me and him sitting on that porch, like really saying we wasn't trying to go broke no more. And the formation of that crew was announced with a bang when Youngboy dropped his earliest surviving music video, the aptly titled NBA. Though to be fair, that video was a very low quality affair, much more Pee Wee hoop practice than the National Basketball Association. And by December the 1st, 2015, Youngboy is going at it alone under his own NBA banner and beginning to drop sneak disses towards his former crew TBG. On the intro of his first truly independent NBA mixtape, Mind of a Menace, he dropped several lines that were directed towards TBG, suggesting that they envied him and that he wasn't willing to work under someone else's administration. Then on the follow-up mixtape Mind of a Menace 2, he continued to drop shade on TBG, suggesting they didn't live up to their promises and that he was ready to go to war with his former allies. After that, his next mixtape Before I Go was filled with even more illuminating lines that seemed to acknowledge a rumor that G-Money had actually hooked up with Youngboy's sister, as well as shooting some vague threats to his former crew. But beefing aside, it was actually NBA Youngboy's October 2016 project and accompanying song 38 Baby that would truly be the watershed moment of his career professionally. Named after his native Baton Rouge hood, Northside 38, the 38 Baby video to this day sits at a comfortable 100 million views and demonstrating his undying love of straps by affectionately licking an Uzi. 
Oh, it tastes like batteries. Frankly, there's so many straps in 38 Baby, I can't tell if it's a music video or an advert for ammunition. Maybe they should call him NBA Gun Boy, hey? <laughs> The success of 38 Baby would see Youngboy's fame rising to new levels. And from there, he managed to land collaborations with fellow Louisiana Baton Rouge legends, such as Kevin Gates appearing on the 38 Baby mixtape track Like Me, and apparently even getting a ghastly Youngboy tattoo, so you know it's real. I got a tattoo of him on me because I love him. And you can say what you want to, but just in Louisiana, when we love somebody, we appreciate them while they're alive. As well as Youngboy appearing on fellow Baton Rouge legend Boosie's track My Lil Son. And it would be these major moves that would have Youngboy's name ringing not just in the streets, but also in the corner offices of record labels. At a certain point in 2016, he signed a $2 million five album deal with Atlantic Records with the help of his manager, Fee Banks, a Louisiana industry legend who apparently had helped Lil Wayne start Young Money and having previously managed Kevin Gates. But hey, sometimes you can rise to the top so fast that it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately for Youngboy, as soon as he would catch that bag, he'd also be catching a serious case that looked like it was set to derail his career in a big way. In December 2016, just before a scheduled show out of state, Youngboy was arrested by US Marshals before touching stage at a show in Austin, Texas, in dramatic scenes that were even caught on camera. Youngboy was charged on suspicion of attempted first degree moider, apparently stemming from an alleged drive-by shooting. Story goes, Youngboy and a number of other men that he was affiliated with, including Ter Londrick Norman, AKA NBA Self Paid, AKA Big B, AKA NBA Boomer, who was actually later arrested for his involvement in this shooting all the way in 2019, along with NBA Ben 10, real name Ben Fee, Fields, and possibly another unnamed person, depending on which articles you read, I'm not sure. The lads were actually accused of opening fire in a South Baton Rouge street, targeting a group of people standing in the front yard of a house around 2000 block of Kentucky Street. Apparently during this incident, an unidentified passenger of their own car was actually hit in the neck, but luckily survived and was found by police later on in the car a few blocks away. Police find a man suffering from a gunshot wound to the neck, saying he was shot in a different neighborhood just a few streets away. Apparently this happened in the midst of a handful of other clappings in the area all happening within space of two days. It's been suggested by many that Youngboy and his crew were actually out on the streets looking to avenge the slaying of Youngboy's 18-year-old cousin Boozilla, real name Keandre Ricks or NBA Boosie, who was apparently gunned down hours earlier. Remember, this is the same guy who had allegedly had a falling out with G-Money over a stolen pack. Running off with a pack? What, this innocent looking chap? I don't believe it. It seemed like Boozilla and the NBA boys had all made up and become friends again after Youngboy had fallen out with G-Money and the TBG crew, and further speculation seems to suggest that apparently this incident might have had something to do with Boozilla dropping a diss track calling out a TBG affiliate named Dusa. Now at this point I would just like to remind everyone that a lot of the information in this story is pure internet speculation and since this incident and a lot of the things surrounding NBA Youngboy in this case haven't been definitively solved we can't necessarily take everything we hear as fact. I'm just trying to feed you the information that's floating around out there on the internet. Now eventually a man named Treshawn Coates was taken into custody for the Boozilla incident while Dusa, real named Renard Clifton, ended up in jail on a different first degree moida charge and the illegal use of a weapon the following year. And even then, apparently 24 hours after that retaliation incident that involved Youngboy and his boys, yet another drive-by took place on the same block as the Boozilla Slay, which left two homes riddled with bullets. With the police alleging a man named Derek Geist to be the driver, along with Coates, the accused trigger man in the Boozilla case only a day before, along with another man, Michael Onyedimma. Now for his involvement in the retaliation incident, Youngboy himself caught two attempted moida charges, and he was held on a 200 thousand dollar bond as well as appearing in his mugshot wearing a fly ass Burberry shirt but I only assume got him an additional charge for being a straight fashion killer. Now at the time Youngboy was only 17 years old but Louisiana is one of the few states in the US where 17 year olds can be charged as adults and so Youngboy spent December 2016 to August 2017 in the slammer but at least for the fans it wasn't all bad because whilst NBA Youngboy was incarcerated his label got to work and re-released two of his projects. They dropped the reloaded edition of Before I Go removing the songs Thug With Me, Change and All Night and adding a 21 Savage remix of Murder, the track Bands, the track Fact, where Youngboy apparently proved how many bands he has by waving them in a shopkeeper's face. All right, Youngboy, you're rich, I believe you. As well as the tracks How We Play It and the track Win or Lose, where he showed off just what it's like to get signed by apparently sticking a sign to his four-wheeler. Weird flex, but okay. The label also released a reloaded version of his Mind of a Menace 3 mixtape, removing the Murder remix with 21 Savage because they put it on the Before I Go mixtape, as well as taking off the tracks Life and Booting in this and adding the tracks Just Made a Play featuring Moneybag Yo and blowing up. And so as Youngboy sat in jail and those tracks picked up heat in the streets, fans would eagerly await his release which came after he copped a very generous plea agreement. 
Now eventually, to pretty much everyone's surprise, Youngboy was able to cut a sweet ass deal, copping to the lesser charge of aggravated assault with a firearm. And whether you think it was record labels pulling strings, his newly acquired Illuminati membership card, or the simple banging of Juju like Heady One, however you look at it, Youngboy managed a big finesse here and got his way out of jail. He was sentenced to a prison term of 10 years, suspended, and three years of active supervised probation, which essentially meant that he was able to get out of jail, but the potential to go back would always be following him around for a good decade. In addition to that, he was also ordered to pay a $5,000 fine, as well as doing 250 hours of supervised community service, which included apparently doing an anti-violence PSA, which to the disappointment of fans everywhere never seemed to actually surface publicly. And apparently during the sentencing, he had what was described as a tense but respectful back and forth with District Judge Bonnie Jackson. Apparently she admonished him for going out with his boys looking for trouble and finding it. And Youngboy, to his credit, kept his cool and took full responsibility for everything that had gone down in this incident. A pretty refreshing perspective compared to people like Shotty screaming Treyway to the judge. However, Judge Jackson went on to say she didn't care about Youngboy's celebrity status and suggesting that his rap music wasn't necessarily helping the violence in the community that he was coming out of. Apparently Youngboy interjected at this point reminding her that nobody had actually died in the incident with her clapping back saying that he's lucky he's such a bad aim and that he wasn't facing first degree M charges. And it is also worth pointing out that the court did hear about how Youngboy had been trying to make a difference in his community by looking after his mother and giving out school supplies. Even if the judge did take a little bit of a dookie on him for having three kids at 17 years old. Damn, I didn't even have three friends at 17 years old. And in response to that frankly condescending dig by the judge, Youngboy had promised do right by his family. And for the record, I would like to point out that Youngboy really is a stand-up guy in this department. Apparently in 2018, he actually found out that one of those kids wasn't even biologically his, with him publicly saying on Facebook because of the man he is, he's going to continue to raise him like his own. So after his plea was accepted, Youngboy was released while he was awaiting sentencing. And so in August 2017, he was back on the streets jugging and musically finessing. Once he got out, he dropped his absolute banger of a song, Untouchable, that ended up hitting number 95 on Billboard. This had a music video that featured a cameo from his newest mentor, Meek Mill, telling him that if he doesn't leave Baton Rouge, he gone die. Following the successful release of Untouchable and himself, he dropped his latest and seemingly most technologically advanced mixtape, AI Youngboy, in August 2017, hitting number 24 on Billboard. His next single, No Smoke, hit number 61, followed by a lucrative AI Youngboy tour. But unfortunately for Youngboy, the violence in Baton Rouge raged on and it didn't take long for those feuds to rear their ugly heads once again. Now, as always, there's a lot of speculation on the internet about the street politics that seem to whir around Youngboy around this time. So for the record, some of what I'm about to discuss will include unproven theories from the internet about what may have been the causes to some of the events that unfolded. And I'm going to avoid pointing the finger at people that haven't specifically been convicted of crimes, whilst also still giving you a rundown of some of the information that circulated on the internet and in the street. Now, the other major beef Youngboy was involved in at this time was with G-Money, a real name Garrett Burton, former friend and star over at his former label TBG. As soon as Youngboy got out of jail and dropped Untouchable, racking up views and money, it seemed that Beef immediately started cracking with G-Money becoming his number one op. And around this time, a sensational interview emerged where G-Money seemed to be talking extremely reckless on Youngboy, suggesting they used to be homies, but pointing the finger at Youngboy, saying that he started sneak dissing once he became successful. So, I mean, do y'all have history? Were y'all ever cool, you know, prior, years prior? Yeah, that little nigga was like my little partner. He used to be like my little brother. He stayed with me and everything. You know, like everything was still all good until he started you know what I'm saying, like doing his own thing, getting him a little buzz, getting a little money, and he just got the big head and just started feeling like in it, like the feelings he been feeling probably deep down the side that he was scared to put out. He let that out once he got a, got a name and got, you know, got from down here. And then dropping maximum shade by being very disrespectful about young boy's sister. Not really, he mad, he mad about his sister too though. About his sister? Yeah, I had fucked her a long time ago. Initially, they went back and forth on Instagram, but a few days later, G Money would officially go at Youngboy on wax with the scathing diss track Industry. Hey, I didn't know Trippy Red was in TBG. And funnily enough, that Chucky doll was actually a reference to an early Youngboy video called What I Was Taught that was way back in September 2016. G Money's diss track Industry called out Youngboy and the NBA crew on a number of bases. It had those lyrics that seemed to hint that Youngboy had been the one who tipped off G Money about Boozilla running off with the pack. It had more lines confirming the hookup and disrespecting Youngboy's sister. He dissed Youngboy for sneak diss him, and as the title of the song suggested, it dropped more shade on Youngboy for signing a record deal and no longer being in the streets, having turned industry. As well as having another important lyric that seemed to confirm rumours that G-Money had actually had a price put on his head. Now, it's been speculated by many people online that Youngboy's agent, a man named Dump, might have had something to do with potentially putting a price
price on G-Money's head. And most shockingly, within around a month of that track industry being released, G-Money was assassinated in a parking lot as he left a recording studio in Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge police are looking into a deadly shooting that claimed the life of a local rapper. Police say someone shot and killed 22-year-old Garrick Burton on Dallas Street around 1.20 last night. Once this went down, all eyes were on the NBA crew and a lot of unverified speculation began to circulate. DeAndre Fields, aka Lil Pap or NBA Pap, was eventually arrested in connection to the incident and bailed around June 2019. Interestingly, Pap is actually the brother of NBA Ben 10, aka Ben Fields, who if you remember got arrested for being in the car with Youngboy in that same incident that Youngboy got the 10 year suspended sentence for. As well as having been rumored to have had some sort of involvement with the G Money beef, with some wild information floating around on the internet, which I'm definitely not gonna get into here. Because let's not forget, everybody is innocent until proven guilty and plenty of alternative theories exist around what happened to G Money. One of which is that G Money's demise may have potentially happened from a completely unrelated beef stemming from an earlier stick up gone wrong. And a recent interview with current TVG frontman and former best friend of G Money, Fredo Bang, suggested that he thought that the man charged didn't actually do the deed. Meanwhile, others have looked to NBA affiliate BBG Baby Joe for answers, citing a lyric on his track Buzzer Beater potentially pointing to some information. A track that for the record is very conveniently not found on Lyric Genius. In that track, he drops the line Herm Catch and Walking Out, which some have speculated may have been a reference to the fact that this all went down when G Money was walking out the studio, and Herm referring to NBA Herm, or Herm the Black Sheep, aka the dude that YouTube comments say has NBA Youngboy's mansion smelling like feet. Nah, no way is it Herm. What, the guy that literally just released a song called Homicide? Seems like a stand-up guy to me! But anyway, regardless of what theory you want to buy into, the rumor that Dump might have had something to do with putting a price on G Money's head seemed to pick up steam, and unfortunately he would face some sad consequences soon after this incident. Youngboy's agent Desmond Dump Hardnett was the victim of a fatal drive-by on May the 4th, 2018 in Baton Rouge. And of course, Youngboy memorialized his fallen brother on his track R.I.P. Dump. Once again, following this tragic incident, many people began to point the finger at TBG and a number of their affiliated rappers who seemed to drop lyrics that hinted towards the incident. With the main rappers involved in TBG at this point being Fredo Bang, Lit Yoshi and Boulevard Quick. And suspicions went through the roof not long later when we began to hear very ominous lyrics from the likes of Lit Yoshi, as well as songs where he would specifically reference 762 Bullets, which just save in your memory now because it's gonna be relevant later in the story. One particular standout lyric was from his song Drake's, where he says he put it on that truck, an obvious reference to Dump. Oh yeah, and also Fredo Bang and Boulevard Quick had a track called Body Bag, where they were once again swinging around another Chucky doll and kept describing shooting as dumping. After the tragic dump incident, Youngboy began making references to catching his ops in retaliation, with lines that many believe were directed at Fredo Bang. And several months after that, another TBG affiliate gets got. Boulevard Quick was sadly taken out in his own home on November the 26th, 2018, with authorities openly investigating whether this may have had ties to the G-Money incident. Boulevard Quick, Baton Rouge police say the local rap was shot and killed. Wells is now the second rapper from his record label who has been killed. This was followed by a number of lyrics from Youngboy discussing back-to-back -back slayings, with fans continuing to speculate that these may have been a reference to these street going-ons. But as always, Youngboy is a master of taking credit for work without being too specific in incriminating himself, unlike some of his ops, who seem to be god darn masters of self-snitching, as we're gonna find out later. But yet, obviously, more bloodshed would not go unnoticed, and as a result, we would see back-to-back -back problems for Youngboy and his NBA crew. And as you may have noticed, there's really very little to joke about at this point in the story. At the start of 2019, NBA Youngboy was riding high off of the news that he had been YouTube's top streaming artist for nearly two years straight. But unfortunately, all that success would obviously come with extra attention from his ops and further attempts to get him and his team down. In May 2019, Rolling Loud would take place in Miami and Youngboy would be in town for a whole weekend of back-to-back -back pressings from his ops. Apparently, early Friday morning, he was attending a strip club party with Young Thug, where apparently someone popped off a few rounds at the party bus that was driving between venues, an attack which TMZ reported was targeting Young Thug. Young Thug and his entourage became the apparent victims of a drive-by shooting that went down this morning on I-95. Young boy, young thug, easy mistake to make, I guess. But for the record, I couldn't find any solid on paper proof that young boy was actually involved in this incident, other than what was said in the Miami Herald article and some speculation on a few Baton Rouge crime channels on YouTube. But unfortunately for young boy, that was only the beginning of the trouble, because at this point, it seemed his ops were as determined to catch a young boy as Michael Jackson on a Cambodian tour stop. And so after that, in a scenario that's unfortunately all too familiar in hip hop these days, shortly after young boy gave up his location on Twitter, his ops pulled up on him with more dicks than the dumpster outside a sex change clinic. 
letting off the choppers broad daylight outside the Trump International Hotel and Beach Resort in Sunny Isles, Miami, where Youngboy and his crew were staying at the time. Apparently, Youngboy was traveling with a large crew that included his girlfriend as well as OG33, as well as several other unnamed affiliates and family members, and they were ambushed by a black Cadillac Escalade as they left the hotel. Youngboy's girlfriend was hit in the shoulder and taken to hospital, but even more wildly, from the moment that shots were heard, members of Youngboy's entourage returned fire with apparently legally registered firearms. Now, unfortunately for the crew, they hadn't spent much time at the gun range since the last incident because authorities described them as standing at the valet section firing rifles wildly from the hip. Well, guess how that went down? Badly. As a result, three bystanders were hit, including a five-year-old child. And even more sad, one of the gunshots between these two crews claimed the life of an innocent bystander, 43-year-old Mohammed Radi, an honest, hard-working guy minding his own business who had just finished his shift working at the Hertz rent-a-car across the street. He worked here for over 10 years, and we are absolutely at a loss for words for what happened to him. He was an innocent victim. Honestly, the only way this incident could have gone worse for Youngboy is if he pulled one of these things out. But apparently investigators couldn't even charge anybody at this point because all of Youngboy's crew that were still at the scene claimed self-defense and Florida apparently has those strict stand your ground laws. But I'm not sure if Florida has a close your eyes and spin around while you're letting off a chopper law, but that's none of my business. The cops said that they were apparently looking to determine who shot first, as whoever shot first could apparently be charged with the first degree moider of whoever got that innocent bystander. Youngboy's lawyer described the scene as an assassination attempt of which he was the target. I mean, assassination, Sam, I would have called it a five-on-one impromptu game of team deathmatch. Youngboy and his label apparently offered to cover the funeral costs for the innocent man, but it's unclear as to whether or not they were taken up on this offer. Youngboy's lawyer had said that apparently he felt terrible about this and he had wished that it had been him rather than the innocent man. And it was initially reported that apparently Youngboy had refused to cooperate with law enforcement who wanted to know who had initiated the shootout, but his lawyer later said that that was actually miscommunication and that he hadn't really been given enough time to try and convince Youngboy to speak to them about the incident. In fact, Youngboy was a apparently initially detained by the cops at the scene, but apparently greased up young boy managed to slip away and pretty incredibly made his way to Rolling Loud where he ended up performing on stage immediately after the incident as if nothing had happened whilst his girlfriend lay shot up in the hospital. A week later, he actually did resurface in Baton Rouge for a court hearing where he was unsurprisingly swiftly thrown in the slammer. As far as the shooter's identity, that's not been strictly solved, though the police have described them as having an AK-47 and several handguns. Well, that narrows it down to any Floridian above the age of six. I personally don't think the investigators are gonna have any luck with this one. I mean, it's not like young boy's number one op lit Yoshi was riding around Miami not long before this posting clips of him holding a chopper, right? Now for the record, there was a lot of speculation that Detroit rapper and winner of Best Dress With No Support, T Grizzly, was somehow involved with this. After the news even reported that the shootout was between their two entourages. We've learned the altercation was between the entourages of NBA young boy and T Grizzly. Apparently it was known that they were beefing after an earlier collaboration attempt went south, with some saying that they potentially fallen out over money, but the most obvious potential cause of them two not getting along was likely the relationship between T Grizzly and another of young boys ops, Fredo Bang. Fredo Bang, man, the internet's been going crazy about y'all relationship and just, you know, seeing y'all together. Is that your, that's your man, that's the homie? I fuck with him. I fuck with any nigga who like genuine and solid and come from that and really trying to change and save his life with this music shit. However, as we all know, a friend of an op is an op. A Facebook friend of an op is an op. Hell, if you even smell like one of my ops, I'm ready to give you the smoke. And even T Grizzly himself seemed to acknowledge the possibility for beef on this basis in an interview where he discussed his affiliations with Fredo Bang. But I might tell you, yeah, you would catch a straight bullet fucking with that nigga. Right, right, right. You feel me? Catch a shot that wasn't meant for you. Catch a warning yeah. You might catch a shot that wasn't meant for you, because if, if I see him and it's this type of time, I ain't sparing him just because the nigga in the car that ain't got nothing to do with it. Because this might be my only time to get him. And a few months later, when T Grizzly lost his auntie slash manager, many conspiracy theorists were pointing the finger at Youngboy. But let's not forget that this incident did go down in Detroit where Youngboy isn't necessarily known to have a presence. And let's not forget that every rapper has got ops all over the place and all kinds of different beasts could have been involved. So let's put those T Grizzly rumors to bed and turn back to the internet speculation where all eyes were on Lit Yoshi, who would soon end up in handcuffs for a whole other bunch of madness. Lit Yoshi was taken in on four counts of attempted murder in December 2019 for an apparent drive-by on NBA and BBG members in Highland Road in Baton Rouge. A 762 cartridge was found at the scene, you know, the type of bullet that Lit Yoshi was bragging about having used earlier in his song Blasting. Ballistics say that the same strap was used in a booting at the 3000 block of Crestwood Street in February 2019 at BBG House. And apparently the police claimed that Lit Yoshi was a suspect in numerous slayings prior to these charges. That's not a good 
look cheap. But considering what a danger to society that this man apparently is, you'd have thought the Baton Rouge authorities would have kept him under lock and key until the facts could truly be determined, right? WRONG! Within a week of learning of his arrest, Lit Yoshi was bailed out and dropping a music video called First Day Out. The video started out with a pretty grating rendition of Siri reading out his charges that he was arrested for, followed by a shot of him walking out that same jail that NBA Youngboy has walked out of so many times before. They might as well just install some revolving doors at this place at this point. And I know what you're thinking. Did he say anything incriminating on that song? Well, I think the top YouTube comment says it all. <laughs> After the Miami shooting, Youngboy was hauled off to jail and a probe was begun as to whether he had used social media to make threats and breached his probation. This was supposedly a social media video which Youngboy's lawyer, and myself included, couldn't even find. She looked at a news feed regarding the article, right. and in the comments there was some sort of embedded video that she since tried to look up and I don't think she was able to find. So. She wants to see if the district attorney's office can find whatever whatever videos they, they find. And I, but I don't know what the video is. Apparently the judge chose to place him in jail after the Miami incident, even though he was the intended target of the assassination, as his lawyer made clear. Recently, he's an absolute victim. There's no question. Police investigated it. They talked to him. They, they, you know, his car was shot up. He was leaving the hotel. He had his mother in the car. He had his girlfriend in the car. And somebody came up, and I don't know what the weapons were, I don't know if it was an AK or what it was, but they opened fire and lit him on fire. This got him a 90 day sentence, which frankly sucked. But honestly, 90 days is a damn sight better than the 10 years that he was potentially looking at had his full sentence been called in. They eventually let him out of jail on house arrest in August, and we got more scenes of him leaving that same jail in a Facebook Live, scenes which eventually made their way into his comeback song, Self Control, as well as him appearing in a celebratory social media video in his garage, like some sort of chopper tote in Ty Lopez, where he seemed to still be rocking his jailhouse moustache and a flat cap looking like Eddie Murphy in Coming to America. And whilst he was on house arrest, he dropped the enormous banger, House Arrest Kings. That track completely blew up on release, racking up millions of views within days, and to this day still sitting around 100 million views on YouTube. As well as beginning that handy trend of him recording music videos at home because he's on house arrest, something that everybody better get used to seeing in 2020. On October 2019, he dropped his new mixtape, AI Youngboy 2, that got him the Billboard number one hit that he had always dreamed of. Achieved mainly due to the fact that he racked up a whopping 144.7 million streams, all in the first week being one of the biggest streaming debuts of 2019. But apparently Youngboy wasn't even safe on house arrest and as always the ops were pulling up to spray in his driveway. <laughs> Come on, I gotta try and keep it light. This story got bleak real quick. And luckily, things would finally turn a corner for Youngboy at the end of 2019. On December 13th, the judge decided to terminate his probation early, since apparently he had completed all of his conditions to date. NBA Youngboy was in court today. He's no longer on probation and says he plans to leave Louisiana. A judge today ended his probation during the hearing. Lawyers for the rapper, whose real name is Kintrell Golden, had argued that he followed all of the court's conditions. Golden was arrested back in May after a deadly shootout in Florida. His defense had argued that he was actually the target of the shooting. Congratulations, bro. Yeah. Oh, How do you feel right now? Good, good, bro. Hey, man. After this big W, he announced he'd be leaving Louisiana immediately. And I gotta say, getting off of a 10 year suspended sentence after an AM charge with no supervision is gotta be one of the biggest wins I've ever seen in hip hop all crime history, full stop. Now apparently there were a couple of outside elements at play that led to the court making this decision. Apparently a court approved music video had actually jeopardized Youngboy's lease. And apparently he was struggling to even find a place where he could stay in the city in the case that the early termination wasn't granted and he wasn't able to leave the state. And apparently Atlantic records had actually sent a notice to the court personally, suggesting that Youngboy's personal and financial safety would not be secure if he was forced to stay in Baton Rouge under these conditions. After being granted his freedom, Youngboy called Judge Jackson a blessing, saying she saved him and had given him opportunity after opportunity up until this point. And honestly, it seemed like the judge had truly had Youngboy's back at this point, apparently previously denying numerous attempts that the DA had tried to revoke his probation and send him to jail. She ultimately told him that she felt that it was the people around
around him that didn't have his best interests at heart that were bringing him down. Ha, <laughs> you think? But that comment clearly resonated with him and he even started off his hit song Lil Pop with the lyric, I cut off my day ones for the win. A lyric that I've got to say resonated with me too. But hey, whether or not Youngboy is actually choosing not to surround himself with murderous goons has yet to be seen. However, what is a fact is the major W that Youngboy finally got out of Baton Rouge and moved him and his family to California. In my opinion, NBA Youngboy is a true inspiration in the fact that he was able to make it out of such a violent and dangerous past and location with his life and his success intact. It seemed like so much blood had been shed on this journey and he'd been given chance after chance, which a lot of people might say that he maybe didn't even deserve. And it's truly heartwarming to see such a young, talented man at this point surviving and thriving after so many hardships. Many people in the rap game, especially Baton Rouge artists, have discussed just how hard it can be to get out and stay out of the trap. And although there's comments all over YouTube and Reddit that discuss this whole ongoing TBG NBA beef, suggesting that there's more bloodshed and violence on the way, I really pray that everybody involved and everybody affected by and touched by this drama can truly move on and put a stop to the violence. Because in this case, the music industry is just one amazing example where a young man from a difficult background has managed to use his talent to escape hardship and provide an incredible opportunity for himself, his family, and his community. Hell, Youngboy's op Fredo Bang even said in an interview recently that the beef is not that deep and he would do a song with Youngboy. I ain't got no problem. Nope. I, 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 ain't, got, okay. I, ain't, got no, I ain't got no problem. I, I'm a... I'm good. I said it in all the play interview. I'll do, I'll do a song with him. And I know that that is being said through a mountain of irony, but since Fredo recently signed a lucrative deal with Def Jam, I would hope that he is a lot more about his bag than beefing at this stage in his career. Because it finally seems that the TBG crew are getting access to those lucrative opportunities that they'd always wanted, and that the NBA click seem to have this far been able to ride all the way to the top. So there is really just one thing to learn from this story. In the midst of all the hardships and coming from some of the toughest environments that you could possibly imagine, Youngboy proved that if you can focus your efforts and your talents in the right direction, you can truly change things for the better. I'm a fan of Youngboy. Hell, I'm even a fan of Fredo Bang. And I'm here to tell you that the fans love the music a lot more than they love the beef. And I know I'm just a pasty, pasty internet nerd from England, but if anybody watching this is going through similar situations to that of what you've heard in this story, and if you're hurting over some street beef that's happened to you in the past, I would simply urge you to just try and focus your energy onto the hustle, onto your craft, and onto your art. And imagine a future of success where you and your families are winning away from all of that street BS. And for NBA Youngboy and his crew, if you're watching this, please, for the love of God, don't ever go back to Baton Rouge. I know I won't be going there. Peace out. What's good? Thank you for watching today's video. I want to give a humongous shout out to my Patreon gang. If you watched last week, you'll know that all of the Patreon money actually went to good causes that are helping those in need, suffering at the hands of this terrible health crisis, which is a real piece of shit. And I hope we beat its ass because it ain't fun. And I hope everybody's staying safe. So that's a big shout out to all of the patrons that made that possible. My boy, Sean Anderson, who I missed out last week, and I apologize. Mathis Martin, Antonio Groza, Bash the Prince, Chris J, Claire Audient, DJ Fred 100, Griffin Fuller, Henry Bryant, Jaden Cho, Jason Wyman, Javier Gonzalez, Big Jessica Simmons, Kizzlebot, my guy, Naraj Shukla, Big Otaku VS, Young Penis Bag McPenis Face, I said it. Pyromancer, Vivi, Wilson Psychedelic, and everybody else's name who you see on the screen now. Appreciate you making a difference and riding with me through this difficult time. I'm also going to make sure that all of the money this month goes to other different charitable causes that are going to help people that are suffering at the hands of this health crisis. So anybody that wants to continue contributing and donating and making sure that that money goes to a good place, head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to announce some new merch soon of which the proceeds will be going to similar causes so keep an eye out for that and i appreciate you thanks so much for watching and until next time as always it's your boy a peace out